Please turn on your microphone when speaking and mute when not speaking. The MAG public comment process allows members of the public to comment on items on today's agendas or on items that fall under the COC's jurisdiction. If you would like to comment at today's meeting, please fill out a white request to speak card located at the information table and give it to MAG staff. If you parked in the garage, parking validators are available on the information table. If you purchased a transit ticket to come to the meeting, please see staff for a ticket. Hearing assisted devices are available for MAG staff. Before I turn it over to Katie to take roll call, I wanted to recognize two members of the board who have stepped off. Letitia Brown Gambino, who has taken a position at Human Service Campus, and Tad Gary, who stepped down with the changing responsibilities at Mercy Care. Thank you both for the amount of time that you have dedicated to the board. With that, Katie, please take roll call and members of the board, please say you are here and your organization after Katie calls your name. Jacqueline Campbell. Lisa Glow. Can you please turn on your mic? Just press the button in front of you. Here. Thank you. Chris Hallett. Here. Chris Hallett is here. You just walked in. Michael Hughes. Here. Thank you. Please tell me your organization. A New Leaf. Thank you. Natalie Lewis. Rachel Milney. Sean Pierce. Sean Pierce, Maricopa County. Charles Sullivan. Charles Sullivan, ABC. Thank you. Danielle Wright. Co-chair Vicki Phillips. Vicki Phillips, Community Bridges. Thank you. Co-chair Rob Potlogger. Here, Valley of the Sun United Way. Thank you. Back to you, Co-chair. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is call to the audience. This is an opportunity for the public to comment on items that fall under the Continuum of Care Board that are not on the agenda or that are on the agenda for discussion and not for action. 15 minutes will be provided for the call to the audience agenda item unless the committee requests an exception to this limit. Katie, were there any comments received or anyone who wishes to offer comments at this time? Co-Chair Phillips, we did have a comment received from Amy Schwabenlinder at the Human Services Campus. She wrote a comment requesting that the COC board co-chairs review the process for in-person members of the public to comment on and or ask questions on board meeting agenda items. Is it allowable for audience members to raise their hand during the meeting? Will a call to the audience be made on each agenda item? Thank you. End of comment. In response to... Thank you, Amy. Uh, we will be offering that in uh, each agenda item. Uh, so uh, we will wait for board members to comment and then offer public comments um, if you are here in person. Thank you very much. We will now move on to the next agenda item. Our next item is approval of the consent agenda. Those are items 3A through 3E and are, the, and are on the agenda for consent. Does any member of the board have any questions, comments, or request a presentation of any of these items? Does any member of the public wish to comment on any items on the consent agenda? Could I have a motion to approve consent items 3A through 3E? This is Sean Pierce, so moved. Thank you, Sean. And can I have a second? Lisa Glow seconded. Thank you, Lisa. Is there discussion of the motion from the board? Are there any comments from the public? For those in the room, we will take a voice vote. Those in favor, please say yay. 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 Those opposed, please say nay. Thank you. I will now ask Katie to proceed with the roll call of those joining online. Thank you, Co-Chair Phillips. Natalie Lewis. Aye. Thank you. Sean Pierce. Aye. Thank you. The motion passes unanimously. Back to you, Co-Chair. Thank you very much. We will now move on to our next agenda item. We'll go into the updates. Just a quick reminder that updates for all committees were included in the COC newsletter and can be found on the MAG website. During the legislative session, we will continue to hear updates on legislative activity. With that, I would like to welcome Joanna Carr, Interim Executive Director with the Arizona Housing Coalition to provide an overview of legislative activity. 
Thank you and hi everybody. Um, yes, I will give an overview of where we're up to um, with the state legislative session. Um, in terms of general updates, um, this will be a long session. Um, committee hearings are still continuing. They will be ending soon and then we will turn to budget negotiations. Um, so this week is particularly busy with um, many housing and homelessness related bills on committee agendas, um, which I will give an update on. Um, first of all, I do want to give a brief update on um, the three remaining priorities of the Arizona Housing Coalition, um, which will all become budget um, negotiations. And so there is hope. Um, these are increasing the housing trust fund and finding robust sources for the housing trust fund. Um, increasing the DES line item from 2.5 million to 25 million, um, and that will be providing um, much needed funding for um, shelter operations um, and other homeless services, um, and then expanding the state low income housing tax credit program, um, which we were successful in implementing two years ago, um, and it's currently due to expire in 2025. Um, so that priority will look at finding additional funding sources. Um, as mentioned, there are many housing and homelessness related bills um, this year that we have been involved in and impacts our community and lots of activity this week particular. Um, in terms of zoning reform, Senate Bill 1117 um, was the primary zoning bill um, that was under much deliberation. Um, that bill did fail, however, the bill sponsor has brought forward alternative bills um, as striker amendments, including Senate Bill 1116, um, which has been heard in House Commerce Committee on Tuesday. Um, that particular bill will require cities with a population over 525,000, um, so Phoenix, um, to allow by right zoning in certain districts, including by transit um, and in existing multifamily housing districts among other provisions. Um, Senate Bill 1163 will also be heard in the same committee hearing on Tuesday and is almost identical to Senate Bill 1117, um, which I mentioned did fail um, and had yielded opposing opinions between developers and municipal governments. Um, there is another bill related to zoning um, being heard this week, House Bill 2536 that was introduced by Toma and is being heard today. Um, that bill would create residential zoning district regulations and limit housing design standard. Um, the, all of these bills um, are designed to address current zoning limitations. And then moving on to bills related to homelessness. Um, we are gonna be tracking House Bill 2649 that's been heard on Thursday, which addresses health and safety in encampments. The language is not yet public. However, we are monitoring this when the language becomes available. Um, Senate Bill 1413 will be heard on Wednesday. Um, this addresses the removal of encampments. Um, the Arizona Housing Coalition has signed in to oppose this bill um, as it, we do not believe it is the right approach to address homelessness. Um, there were two other bills related to homelessness that there has been a much stakeholder impact in, uh, sorry, input in. Um, the first is Senate Bill 1585. Um, this bill is awaiting a further committee hearing um, and addresses solutions to homelessness through funding for facilities. Um, we have been involved in this bill, um, as have quite a number of stakeholders, um, and the bill sponsor has been working with stakeholders to collaborate on language amendment. Um, there has remained some concerns around citations um, within the bill language, and we continue to monitor this. And then House Bill 2284, um, this was a homeless facilities bill um, introduced um, Early on in the session, the coalition, um, we were concerned with the language around this bill and um, because there were significant concerns around criminalization. Um, however, the, the criminalization piece of this bill language has now been removed um, following much stakeholder input and is pending a vote from the House. And they are the major legislative updates. I'm happy to take questions at this time. Thank you, Joanna, for the legislative updates. Does any member of the board have discussion on this item? No? 
question? Okay. Yeah, I'm wondering on 1585, um, when did, did you say it's up for another hearing or it's awaiting assignment? Um, just one moment, let me check. I believe it's waiting another committee hearing. It passed, one second. And, and I believe it, it attached $150 million appropriation as well, which was Did. An, an update. It was written about, I think, in an editorial or a couple editorials too. I just think it's important for the um, this committee to be aware of that, this board to be aware of that bill. I think the League of Cities and Towns is supporting it. We share your concern around the citations. I don't know if she's going to change that or not, but mm -hmm. I think it still has substantial city report and uh, city s support too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Um, yes, so um, this passed Senate last week and is pending a committee assignment and hearing in the House. That's the current update. Thank you. Are there any additional questions from board members? All right. Any comments from the public? Hi. Any <laughs> Amy Schwab and Lender Human Services Campus. I, I feel on this agenda item, there's missed opportunity in hearing from a minimum of the continuum of care committee, if not work groups that are doing something tied to the strategic plan. Um, so pre-COVID when we were only in person and these meetings were full of people and really talking about all of the work that was going on. Um, there were questions and conversations between the committees, the board members, um, the work groups, in my opinion, shouldn't be meeting if they're not doing work tied to the COC board and the strategic plan and reading the updates online. Um, as now a member of the audience, I have a list of questions, but I'm not sure that people are here to answer them. And so it's a bit concerning to me that these two hour meetings aren't filled with people who want to talk about things like what is the ESG work group doing? Are they completing actions that tie to requirements of HUD and coordinated entry and the continuum of care? What's the difference between the data committee and the data analytics committee? Um, the move on work groups, the update I read, so there's no public housing authority interested in participating. And we've talked about move on being an important strategy for the long-term uh, success of the continuum of care. And so I think uh, for the committees, it would help the board to hear from the people directly and for those committees to maybe even ask the board where they need help, where do they need participation, what's standing in the way of making progress. Um, so that's not really a question, it's more feedback and a comment that I, I think our COC needs to spend more time actually talking about the work and how to move the work forward. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Richard DiCarlo from St. Patrick's Catholic Community in Scottsdale. Um, part of my work is around education and advocacy for our parish. Um, I was just wondering, could you please repeat the numbers of those bills so I can track them uh, for folks in our parish? Yeah, would it be helpful? Um, I'll say I could put them in the chat, but I know most of you are in the room. Um, okay, one second. Okay, so um, on the zoning bills, we have um, Senate Bill 1116, Senate Bill 1163, House Bill 2536. And then on the homelessness bills, we have House Bill 2649, Senate Bill 1413, Senate Bill 1585, and House Bill 2284. Any additional comments from the public? All right. 
Thank you. We're going to go ahead and move on to the next agenda item. Uh, we'll be looking at system performance measures for FY 2022. We have Stephanie Crum, HMIS manager with Solari Crisis and Human Services, will provide an overview of the FY 2022 system performance measures, which were submitted to HUD. All right, good afternoon, thank you. And yeah, then we're gonna be talking about our 2022 submission for system performance measures. And we're gonna be talking a little bit about how this ties into the NOFO as well. And so when we're looking at our submission, our official submission period um, is uh, October 1 of 2021 through September 30th of 2022. And next slide, please. All right, so let's talk a little bit about, before we get into the numbers, about the federal framework and sort of how our system performance measures fit into that. Um, HUD really wants the experience of homelessness to be rare, brief, and non-recurring. And how they go about measuring that is through uh, reports like the system performance measures. And underneath each one of rare, brief, and non-recurring, I put the system performance measure that um, helps look at that, um, that framework. So with rare, we're looking at, you know, the number of persons in the system, how many are new. When we're talking about the concept of being brief, we're looking at our length of time and then also income as that will um, affect how long someone stays in the system and how quickly they can leave the system. And then non-recurring, of course, we're looking at percents of returns and our positive exits. And then job and earn income growth supports all of this. Um, experience being rare, brief, and non-recurring as well. So next slide, please. How this kind of ties into NOFO scoring is I wanted to, to call this out because system performance is such a big percentage of your overall NOFO scoring. So if you look here, um, system performance and then your strategic planning around your system performance makes up about 50% of your total score for um, NOFO. So there is a lot of emphasis on system performance and the strategic planning around it because of things like this. You know, it's it's a really big part of your application for um, the NOFO. All right, so let's get into our numbers and we're going to be looking at, let's, yeah, go ahead. That slides, next slide's good. Um, we're going to be looking at the current submission year um, as compared to last year's submission as well. Um, which was the 2021 submission. So this first measure, we're looking at our first time homeless, and this is a system total of clients entering a homeless project without a prior, prior homeless entry in the past 24 months. And the program types we're looking at here are emergency shelter, transitional housing, and safe haven. So the desired trend here is, is obviously we want to go down. We, you know, um, 2021, we had about 11,402. Um, for 2022 submission, we had about 13,591. So it's about a 19% increase in first-time homeless um, in our system from uh, the previous year. So we're, we're heading upwards in that direction when our desired trend is downward. Uh, next slide, please. I don't think it flipped yet. The next one should be returns to homelessness. Oh, well, I can work with whatever the next one is in line. <laughs> there we go, returns to homelessness. So measure two, we are looking at the system percentage of clients who exited to housing and then return to homelessness within 365 days. And so the excess that we're looking at is any permanent housing exit from all program types. And then our return entry, we're looking at any return to a homelessness program type. And again, here, your desired trend is down, downward, and we are actually trending in the right direction here. 2021, our system percentage of, of returns was about 18%. And looking at our 2022 numbers, we're down to 13%. So we are um, moving in the right direction there. All right, next slide. All right. 
And here we're looking at job and earned income growth. Um, we are looking at an aggregate percentage of the clients across the COC who had increase in, in cash income. So we're looking at employment income and then also uh, non-means tested benefits like SSI, SSDI. Program types, we are looking at homelessness prevention, transitional housing, safe haven, and then your permanent housing projects. So your rapid rehousing, PSH, et cetera. There are, you're gonna see two bars here on the screen because we look at the earned income growth for people who are, who are system stayers or program stayers, I should say, and then those who are program leavers. Um, the desired trend is an increase on both sides for both those who are staying in the program and those who are leaving programs. We are trending um, downward for both. So for our stayers, we are at 55% and last year we were at 57%. And for our leavers, we're at 33% when last year we were at 38%. All right, next slide, please. Well, I think we, did we get um, length of time in shelter? I think we, there we go. Length of time in shelter. So this is the system average amount of days that folks are spending in these project types below, which are emergency shelter, transitional housing, and safe haven. And in 2021, that was about 102 days. And in 2022, it's 114 days. So um, again, we're, we're heading upwards um, when the desired trend is to be reducing that length of time in shelter. And then I think the next slide is our last one, which is our successful placement in or retention of permanent housing. So we're looking at, again, two different kind of measures that pull into this overall measure. We're looking at our system percentage of housing exits in the dark green, and the lighter green is the system percentage of housing retention, and that is the folks who stayed in permanent housing programs. So again, the desired trend is, is upwards. Um, we want to be housing more people and having more people staying in housing. But in actuality, we're, we're going down a little bit. For 2021, we were at 40% for exits, where 2022 were at 36. And for retention, we were at 97% retention in 2021, and we're at about 96% for 2022. All right. Sorry, I apologize that I sent that deck to you out of order. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. Um, I do want to call out that there is plenty of opportunity here um, with strategic planning and with continuum of care funding to really impact system performance measures. When we talk again about that federal framework of rare, brief, and non-recurring, there are some suggestions, some things that we can really look at here for each of those sections um, to begin to address this, you know, as far as um, strengthening diversion and leveraging existing prevention that we have to make occurrences rare, um, increasing our rapid rehousing, targeting long-term stayers, those kind of targets um, to really make this experience brief. And then looking at move on strategies, progressive engagement, um, really looking at strategic ways to make this experience non-recurring and of course, all of these are supported by job and income growth, where we can look at improving existing partnerships we might have, you know, with partners like DES or other employment, um, you know, type organizations, um, and then also income stabilization. All right, so I, ha I have talked a lot. <laughs> Thank you very much for allowing me to come and present this, and I wanted to open it up for questions. Thank you, Stephanie. Are there any comments or discussion from the board members or the public? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Natalie. I um Thank you very much for this. Um, a little disappointing to see where we're what we're headed as as a system and as a region. I'm I'm curious about a couple of things, um, and and maybe the people in the room that have more experience with this can can talk about it. But 
I'm curious about, you know, we, we pulled together a regional strategy that just went into place last year. How long does it take for a system approach like that to start seeing improvement in the entire system forward? Um, and, and then secondly, what, how did we score the last time we did this when we were looking at the difference between 21 and 22, or I guess 20 and 21? How did we score? How did that look? Were we making more progress than we are today? I'm, I'm curious about that too. This is Katie. I am looking to Stephanie to answer some of that. So uh, a couple of things, Natalie. The first thing is it's always going to take time for data to catch up to us. So all of this is on the federal fiscal year. So October 1 to September 2022 is what all of the data that was just presented to you on. So to some degree, it's in the midst of it. The other piece of it is um, for some of these measures, the more we do, we're also capturing more people. So um, the, per the system performance measures don't do a great job of capturing unsheltered folks. So when we add shelter beds, now we're getting more people from unsheltered into shelter beds and the system performance measures just don't measure those. So there's not a ton of things that are measuring outreach within the system performance measures or people who are unsheltered. So you're with us doing more, you're going to see first-time homeless numbers go up because those are measuring people in emergency shelter, safe havens, and transitional housing spaces. Um, the second thing I would say is um, as we add more housing, that's going to make length of time go down. But with more people that we're capturing, we also still have that blockade of not moving people through emergency shelter into housing fast enough because we still don't have enough. So even though we are doing more than we were doing before. It doesn't mean we've like completely turned the system around. Um, the second piece that I wanna kind of highlight to some degree um, is there are a couple measures that we are moving in the right direction. Returns to homelessness, we're down to 13% and that was exactly what our goal was. Um, as far as the historical look back about a month ago, I'm looking at my team right now, um, we launched a page on our website that is specifically tracking the system performance measures yearly and then quarterly when we track them. So um, you'll see the last year from a quarterly basis and then all the way back to 2018 system performance measures. So it does show a, a larger trend line rather than just last year comparatively to this year. Um, just wanted to give you that reference point for this presentation comparatively to what we submitted on the federal fiscal year. So um, thank you, Katie. I think that was really helpful insight when we're going through this. Um, I, I'm curious about how this presentation is going to be shared with other groups. I don't know if it's going to um, the MAG Management Committee and to the Regional Council, because um, I, I think you need to provide that kind of perspective about what we've been doing within the system so they understand the numbers versus just looking like we're failing as a system. Thank you, Natalie. It's good feedback. Uh, Natalie, I guess to wrap up that question, this doesn't go to Management Committee and Regional Council. Um, the next update to Management and Regional Council will be um, just the link back to the system performance measures that are on our website. This is just uh, part of a presentation to you all because we just submitted these in February to HUD and we're required to submit them on an annual basis to HUD. So um, do anticipate that you all will continue to take action. Part of your board strategic plan is I should say most of your board strategic plan is rooted in these system performance measures to make changes over time. Um, one last question, I'm sorry for clarity then. Um, so when we submit these to HUD, do we provide some of the information that is happening about in our system so that they have that perspective as well? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, when, yeah, let me take that one, Katie. Um, when we submit um, all of these federal reports, um, both uh, system performance measures, um, the hit pick and the LSA, um, there are opportunities for narrative that we can give to HUD and we typically work with a HUD liaison on any of those um, things. They will typically flag um, large changes. So like, you know, with the drop in returns, they wanted an explanation as to, you know, well, what, why was that happening? Is your data correct? You know, they want validation. So we do go through that process before a final submission. 
And I guess the other thing, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, you cut out. Sorry, I need to turn my mic on. Um, the Stephanie rattled off the other required reports that are submitted to HUD. So this is one data point of a series. We also submit the longitudinal system analysis or the LSA, the point in time and housing inventory counts. Um, so all of these are kind of HUD in tandem with all of the other pieces too. Great. Um, this is Rob. I've got a, a suggestion and a comment. So um, Natalie, what I heard from you really is more of the storytelling and the background to what got us to where we are today. I know in previous conversations that we've had uh, with the board on different topics, we have seen that also before about um, how can we tell the story that we're actually moving things ahead, given um, all of the work that's being done. So I think, Stephanie, any opportunity to continue to uh, pre-tell the story, then tell the story and after that, explain what we're gonna be doing next is really what I heard from, from Natalie's suggestion. I think in general with a lot of the individuals who were in the room shaking their heads. So great work, uh, just something to, to think about uh, as we continue to improve the communication through this. So thank you. I have, I have a question. <clears throat> I don't know if it's the appropriate time, but maybe Katie for you, have you caught any concern of the way some of the contracts are in terms of cost reimbursement that what happens is you have to get to, to put in your payment to get reimbursed you have to come up with the cash and and so what happens is as as rapid rehousing contracts and, and all of these from a provider point of view we're finding it more and more challenging that the hundreds of thousands of dollars that we have to come up with and then provide the service, provide the, the, the payment, let's say to Home Inc. And you've got to pay these hundreds of thousands of dollars and then get reimbursed 30, 60, 90 days later. Has that come up on your radar in terms of anything that, or other agencies, are they, are they finding out a struggle? According to Amy, yes, that's real. We have, um, we have, we have not had people approach us about they are not able to continue services because yeah. of reimbursement. However, you can work with your HUD rep to draw down at different periods. So we have some agencies who draw down at 30, 30 days rather than quarterly for that specific reason. I think this may be a little bit of a nuanced conversation. We're happy to offer technical assistance on it too. Well, thank you. <laughs> Can I ask a question about a definition? How is safe haven defined in this report? That's a, that's a great question. Um, safe haven is a project type designated by HUD. There aren't um, very many um, safe haven projects in Maricopa County, and I believe that they are um, better in projects and how they are designated right now. Uh, there aren't any other safe haven types in Maricopa County. Thank you. My second question is, something I'm trying to understand better is what, how does this have an impact on potential funding to the COC when these kind of things are submitted, if it does at all? Yeah, absolutely. Like I, I had presented in the beginning of the presentation that the system performance measures and your strategic planning around that is um, a big chunk of what gets scored for your NOFO. I know Katie can probably speak a little bit more to the scoring of the NOFO. Um, I'm not as, uh, I think, ad adept on that, but it is a very uh, big part of it. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, yes, part of our NOFO score is um, how have we increased or decreased um, our system performance measure scores. So um, that is one component of the scoring criteria, but as Stephanie presented at the beginning, it's a pretty large component. So we get points for moving in the right direction. We get zero points if we move in the wrong direction, and it makes us competitive with our annual application each year. And then my last comment is with the funding going down with COVID, do we measure that in the context of what we send to HUD? Because I suspect we're going to see outcomes not improve and go in the wrong direction unless there's additional funding that comes in for getting people into housing, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't, we're in a really unique time and I don't know how that gets factored in if 
if you have any input on that or if we need to provide input when, when it gets submitted. Yeah, that, that's a great question and will be really relevant for next year's submission. We had a lot of the ESG CV projects or COVID funded projects were funded through um, the submission period. So they like the closures of those projects won't be felt on this submission, but will be for next submission. So um, those will be things to think about. And again, that's those are the types of narrative that we can provide to HUD, you know, that these projects were closed and this money, um, you know, was was not there for the submission season. Can I also add, every, mm -hmm. um, these measures are used for every COC. So every other COC who is having ARPA money and CARES money go away is going through the exact same thing. So I won't say that everybody is moving in the wrong direction with their system performance measures, but I will say that like m a lot of people are losing millions of dollars because this huge amount of federal investment is ending. That makes sense. And I think, you know, the narrative, the idea of putting it in the narrative at one of our programs that we opened up during the pandemic in Glendale, we're seeing more people come back looking for housing support that they can no longer get because there's a decline in the eviction prevention support dollars. So there's going to be hundreds of people not getting support. More people are becoming homeless. Evictions are up. I think it's important to provide the context since Arizona has such, or Maricopa County has such a high eviction rate. I just worry that we'll get punished in our funding by not, you know, putting that narrative. So I know providers like Cass and probably New Leaf and others have some of those stories, if it's appropriate to go in that. My team can contest that we write all of these and uh, come NOFO, I'm sure we will come back around. We spend a lot of time working with data on that, but I'm happy to include. Thank you, Lisa. Chris? Yeah, question. Thank you, uh, Chris Hallett, City of Peoria. Um, so those numbers are all fiscal year, federal, done, and that's what we're going to be evaluated on, correct? And that's six months old data. Are we able to get that synopsis? Can we use that to compare to the current online one that we're tracking that has a trend? And then what are we doing about when we're going the wrong directions? Do we have any corrective actions we can discuss? So uh, we pull our system performance measures on a quarterly basis. It's also slightly delayed. So like your December data was just approved in February. That was the quarter federal fiscal year quarter one, but calendar year quarter four. So October through December. Um, so those were presented to you all and those are updated on our website under that system performance measures. We're working to update the FY 2022 SPMs um, on that online dashboard. So that's really what we use to track. Um, this is just more to give you all context. Um, as far as corrective action, I think there is a series of things that are being worked on specifically in your board strategic plan. Every strategic plan under the system performance measures has a system performance measure that it's getting tagged back to. So returns to homelessness or income growth or things like that. So all of those actions have a tie back. Um, it's how are we accomplishing that? And then are there additional tasks that you all want to embark on to go towards those system performance measures and who is going to take on that work. I think it is less corrective action and more proactive changes that we're making. Um, there is not a lot of, some of these, like for example, having less people first time homeless, we need to spend more in prevention and to have people not come into our system versus like corrective people entering data wrong or something like that. There are some, like data quality issues that we're also working on, but I think a lot of them are more, we need to take more actions in certain ways rather than correct behavior that's happening or correct things, if that makes sense, or stop funding. Yeah, my concern is we're already six months into the next evaluation period and we're still looking at last year's, which we're gonna be measured on. And I've chimed in on a couple of the working committees. And again, I'm doing that to figure out how can we as board be supportive of them and I think to Amy's point and some of the others who spoke about having their own mandate in-person conversations, because that's where a lot of the discussions can happen. I can almost argue on the other side is I would have a lot of things at my fingertips if I was at my desk right now versus here in a person and having to print out a, a deluge or pull it up online anyways. But I do think there's a missed opportunity on that frequency. And that's what I heard from some of the working committees is 
how they all can interact together. And they were talking about at least once a year, they used to do it, if not more. And, and there's an appetite for that. And I'm just thinking we're six months through our next evaluation period. We need to be able to respond more quickly, have access to that data and, and really tie it back to each strategic action that you just spoke of. You know, I made a note to bring my plan. So I have everything at my fingertips so we can say, okay, but then they're not here to talk about the working committees to say, hey, where are we at in here? And I know we used to do a lot of report outs in the updates, and now it's just if they have something to report, we might want to flip that back again and say, we need to know where we're at on strategic plans relative to these system performance measures and what are we doing to correct them? Because I think those numbers already reflect all the money that was available and they were trending now. So we haven't even begun to see what we're going to see from the lack of the funding. Thank you, Chris. I'd like to, to circle back with the uh, public and see if there's any additional questions or feedback if, after conferring. Oh, sure. I think some of, the, some of the thoughts that I had in that data was, oh, I'm sorry, Matthew Kelly with Mercy here, um, also a co-chair of the Coordinated Entry Subcommittee. Um, just as well, I think a lot of the stuff has already been said, understanding the data, like we're reporting increases and decreases without any justification. There are tons of programs that are being represented in that data. It's really helpful to know where we're seeing the increases and decreases because we could be looking at a couple of outlying programs or we could be looking at the system as a whole. And I think getting a better comprehension of like what's actually happening with those numbers would also be super helpful, I think in coordinated entry. I just looked at the length of stay in um, shelter as an example. Um, one of the things that we've been looking at is doing a prioritization for individuals who are long stay or in shelter and kind of then is that being implemented and do we need to go back and look at that or this is just one example that came to my head of stuff that I'm aware of but I'm quite sure across the board there are things I don't know and maybe Stephanie can tell me this. Are you able to source more information surrounding that when you do report out on this quarterly that says, hey, these are the trends that we're seeing. But in addition to that, these are the things that we're kind of seeing as maybe trending to cause some of those increases or decreases so that we have some, I think from the board's perspective, you can say, hey, yeah, we need to bring this back to coordinated entry or the data subcommittee really needs to be looking at this or whatever the case may be, because then committees can be charged with doing some work. And I, I know if the board tells me that I'm supposed to be doing something as a co-chair, I'm happy to be responsive to those items as well. So just putting that out there. Um, I'm speaking for coordinated entry. I can't speak for every other committee, but um, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you, Matt. Can I just say, I, I agree, we should have the committees involved and as we figure out what some of the things should be that we target. Um, and thank you for speaking on behalf of the coordinated entry subcommittee. Richard Southey from CAS is on that with you. And we were having a conversation today about positive exits and how the amount of time it takes to track the positive exits. So we put a lot of staff time into doing that and updated stuff in the system over the last six months. Speaking to Solari, I think they're going to put together a program that will help run a report automatically, and I think other providers have asked for this. So that's going to improve our system's performance, and we don't have to spend hundreds of hours trying to track that because we don't have access to someone else's system. So things like that are the kind of recommendations I would like to come to this board um, from those of you who are the experts in that. So I would assume that would improve improve positive exits if we have a we can run a report and you know so but maybe it won't change anything in the end if the way Solari's running it, but maybe it will if it's compiled from all of the providers. I don't understand enough about the data, but I think it could make a difference. Thank you, Lisa. Any additional comments, feedback? All right. We'll go ahead and move on to the next uh, agenda item. We're gonna talk about the notice of funding opportunity 
Dylan Belmont from the Human Services Planner with MAG, sorry, Human Services Planner with MAG will provide an overview of the Notice of Funding Opportunity Scorecard. Thank you, Co-Chair. Um, well, speaking of funding and system performance and a bunch of things that are super relevant to our last presentation, um, wanted to share a few updates on the revisions to the NOFO scorecard. Um, it might look familiar to you. This is one of the tools that's used um, to help determine the funding recommendations each year when that NOFO funding opportunity goes out. Um, so these scorecards were included in all of your packets and they have included um, those little yellow boxes. Those are comments showing um, how it has changed since 2022. Um, primarily, the, uh, the biggest change that we're looking at is um, updating the, the system performance that these projects are ranked on, right? So, so each project uh, submits their application and then automatically based on their data, they are you know, auto-scored using these metrics. And um, previously, like uh, 2022, uh, we had been using system performance from like 2017 to 2018. Um, so the biggest change is that now they, they reflect that um, federal reporting period that uh, Stephanie's presentation just went over. So uh, those are, are weighted system averages um, for these programs, um, which does affect um, you know, how, how the projects are scored. Um, one other thing I want to comment on, uh, Tyler, could you scroll down a little bit, please? Uh, keep going. Okay, you can stop there. Thank you. Um, another adjustment that has been made, um, you'll see here on, on 2A, for example, the, the system performance is 93%. Um, in prior years, 93% would have been the, the cap. That's, that's full points. However, it has been adjusted to just under full points in order to sort of uh, increase the range of scores that projects can receive. Um, previously had uh, a lot of instances where projects would score similarly and, and present challenges for um, the ranking process. So um, sort of raise the bar um, in, you know, the max amount of, of points that uh, a project could score, um, not to uh, sort of uh, challenge anyone uh, or provide consequences. It's, it's really just to uh, increase that, that diversity of scoring and, and better inform the, the ranking process. Um, and then just a little bit more, I think, to the next page, Tyler. So, so those are a bunch of technical changes, of course. We also heard um, from feedback, if you could keep going a little bit more. I think it should be at 12. Uh, we also heard feedback uh, from we had a, a public listening session um, and also took it through the, the committee process. Um, one of the things that we heard was that uh, there needed to be a very specific and direct call out to um, how organizations implement, um, you know, those with lived experience in, in program design and also overall decision making, um, not only uh, how they're doing it, but, but also providing uh, specific evidence and, and proof that it's um, written out into their um, program capabilities, right? So, so that was included. And um, really from there, a few other technical changes. Uh, now the scorecard is an even 100 points, which is wonderful. Um, and yeah, that's about it. Happy to take any questions. One other change, um, thank you, Charles and the ABC team. All of these are based off of weighted averages, not just averages of scores. So um, that is a change that came between the committee and the board meeting. The only, uh, it only had an impact, I think, on two, which was slightly ironic, but um, the biggest change you'll see is on this 1A under PSH. Thank you, Dylan. Are there any other comments for discussion from the board or public? This is uh, Michael Hughes, a newly, I just wanna say thank you. It was very thorough and a lot of information. A lot, and I think the 100 points are really helpful also. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. For those in the room, we will uh, go ahead and take a voice vote. Those in favor, please say yay. yay. Those opposed, please say nay. Okay, I will now ask Katie to proceed with the roll call of those joining online. Thank you, Co-Chair Phillips. Jacqueline Campbell? Yay. Natalie Lewis? Yay. Sean Pierce? Yay. Danielle Wright? I'm sorry, no vote. I just got here, I didn't hear anything. Thank you, Danielle. Bye. Did I miss anybody? Motion passes unanimously with Danielle abstaining. All right, the motion passes. And with that, we will move on to our next agenda item. I'm gonna hand it back over to Dylan to provide an overview of the learning management system. Dylan. Well, thank you, Co-Chair. Um, yes, very like extremely exciting. Um, very pleased to share some information about a project that has been in development for, for quite a while um, and will hopefully be a really great asset for the community moving forward. Um, I'm of course talking about the learning management system. Um, so essentially, you know, one of the biggest roles of the COC is to provide technical assistance and training. Um, we hear a lot of really good feedback from uh, those in the community who, uh, you know, appreciate being able to uh, get the information for standardized best practices and, um, you know, just ways to, to improve programs, right? And so that leaves us with the question of how can we take that information and make it more consistent, uh, more engaging, and, and really just as informative as possible. And so the proposed solution to this is, uh, Wow. So here we have the, the learning gateway, um, although feel free to still call it the learning management system or the LMS uh, if you want. So what's so special about it? Well, essentially it's going to be a um, like single place to access all training and information. It, it's a centralized repository, right? Um, no more will there be uh, asking around to, to find who has the, the recording of a training that happened four months ago, um, everything will be you know, right there. We'll also have interactive course tracks, right? So a lot of the, the information in, in this field is, is, can be complex at times. So uh, it can often be broken down in, into smaller courses, uh, but put together in a series that, that makes it um, organized and, and really accessible. Um, also just wanna highlight, uh, when I say interactive, I, I mean, um, you know, a, a lot of different things, right? This, this platform offers um, a lot of flexibility in, in terms of how trainings can be delivered um, more than, than a static uh, video. It, it could be, uh, you know, maybe someone provides a, a short answer response to something and then um, peers who are also taking the training um, can comment on those responses. Uh, from the back end, uh, a, a much more advanced system of reporting and analytics, um, which is very helpful for us to figure out, you know, what trainings does does the community really engage with, um, what needs more support, and so on. Um, and lastly, um, certificates for uh, completing courses. Um, this is something that uh, can be taken throughout the community um, to, you know, track individuals' progress. Um, something that that can be helpful. Project timeline. Um, so essentially, just want to give a brief history on where this project has been. Obviously, um, everything traces back to, I think, like 3400 BC when the ancient Sumerians developed writing for the first time. And then a few other things happened. And then late last year, uh, we started talking with community partners um, and other COCs who uh, already had learning management systems in place. Um, we learned a lot from them in, in terms of, uh, you know, what features really make a difference and, and what sort of nuances with, with the use case is, is going to be applicable to our COC. So from there, then we narrowed down the um, sort of which vendors we were going to engage with who, who met all of those criteria, um, who was going to be cost effective. Um, and that led us to last week when... Um, 
at MAG Regional Council, um, a contract with an organization called WorkRamp was um, approved and uh, implemented. So now we're in, in the sort of first, first steps of, of getting everything going, um, building out the platform, getting those initial trainings in there, um, and then starting to get some limited user testing as well, which will then transition naturally to uh, sort of a segmented rollout over the next few months. Uh, of course, I'd really like to recommend um, keeping an eye on the COC newsletter. That's where we'll have um, any of our major updates to, to the rollout. So what kind of trainings might we see in the LMS? Just a whole bunch. Um, truly, it, it will cover, you know, HUD regulations and uh, skills training, best practices, as I mentioned before, um, and so much more, right? Uh, we really want to make sure that this remains receptive to community priorities and, and what we need to hear about. Um, so, you know, for example, heard a lot about um, increasing awareness of, of data definitions. And uh, we just had our coordinated entry uh, assessment completion. And uh, there are some gaps with, with CE trainings as well. Um, so there's a running list of, of over 100 possible topics that um, will be coming to you over time. However, man, I've been talking a lot. However, this is a tall order because that is a lot of training. And how's that gonna happen, right? Where are they gonna come from? Well, everywhere. Um, some of this will obviously be produced in-house by MagStaff. Um, a lot of it will be similar to how trainings have been done in the past, uh, partnering with, with um, other community agencies. Um, the Tucson Pima COC has an LMS in place already and they have content that they're willing to share with us. And then uh, of course there are also uh, external repositories and, and resources like HUD Exchange who also have tools that can be used in, in this LMS. Oh, and one quick housekeeping note, um, I know Everyone loves coming in person, drinking the delicious mag water. Um, and that's something that like obviously can't be replaced, right? So um, we still want to keep those face-to-face -face interactions. Um, this system isn't going to replace those. Um, if anything, it'll coexist with them and, and even heighten those experiences, um, heighten it through a, a very seamless transition into uploading that content into the system for those who weren't able to make it. Um, and also registration to those events is gonna be a lot easier um, instead of you know dealing with um, emails and, and Zoom here or there, it'll be uh, on the homepage. Uh, you'll have a, a calendar of upcoming events that users can register for with a single click of a button. And while we're on the topic, just want to throw a quick shout out to two days from now where there's going to be a SPDAT training here in the office. Um, if you or, or someone from your organization is interested, uh, please let us know and, and we can get you that information. Okay, um, so now the, the actual logistics, right? Like how do we get it started? How do you get there? Um, pretty simple for, for everyone in this room. If you're a COC board member, you've done almost everything you need to. There's going to be a form on the website for uh, individuals and organizations both to um, request licenses, um, and then they'll be able to get access. So more information to come, keep an eye on the newsletter. Lastly, um, I just want to uh, thank everyone um, in this room and beyond. I know a lot of you have led and assisted with trainings um, and but truly uh, just bringing together all of this information in one place, being able to build each other up um, with these best practices is, is really what makes our uh, region stronger. So thank you and, and so much more to come. Uh, with that, contact information is on the screen. Please reach out if you have any um, questions and, and I'm happy to take any now. Great, um, thank you, first of all, Dylan. 
Can I go? Do you want to go first? Great, thank you. Appreciate that. Dylan, I just wanted to acknowledge um, the excitement I could hear in your voice and in your face when you're talking about the gateway. I know it's a lot of work to, to pull something together. I also know it's a team effort. I think uh, talking to other communities to find out what they have done and being able to have best practices uh, is critical in order to move things together. Uh, previously working for an organization that represented uh, communities in over 50 cities, I think sometimes communities feel that they are, are unique. And in a lot of cases, they're very similar. So however you could do that is, as this is built out, um, I highly recommend that. So uh, good work. Thank you, co-chair. Um, yeah, that's definitely something that I want to highlight is that, um, you know, there's no need for this to be duplicative of existing efforts. Um, it's not like a ton of this information will be completely new, right? Like people have said it before. That's the whole point of, of, of why it is a best practice in the first place. So um, we really want to leverage what already exists with um, just the convenience of this new platform in order to sort of hit both aspects. I had to think of my name, Cricket Weatherington, Arizona Housing Inc. First question I had is, is there going to be an ongoing like work group of community providers helping to manage or develop what happens going forward. I know there used to be a work group that people were weighing in on. Different providers have such different needs, um, like what the actual curriculum is, all of those kind of things, or will that be managed by MAG specifically? Yeah, thank you, Cricket. That's a great question. Um, so in some of our conversations with um, partners in, in exploring the LMS, um, we did find out that a lot of people who um, you know, even were involved in that previous work group, um, those connections still exist. Um, and I think it's definitely something that could be opened back up as we start getting this platform launched and, and sort of get the um, path forward. Can I add? Uh, I think the, the goal is to get it launched and get trainings into it and then starting to prioritize what trainings are most needed versus least needed. I think there was, and maybe not, it's not even least needed, just needed not as immediate as some of the other ones. I think there is an initial list of over 120 that were brainstormed in combination with that last work group in Tucson and Balance the State. We're going to try to figure out what is already available publicly that can be pulled in. And that's probably not the end all be all, but it is at least a first step to get folks trained. Um, like HUD has a rapid rehousing series. Probably not the best, maybe not the most applicable to Maricopa, but at least a starting point. And then um, doing a series of uh, surveys and conversations with folks as to when we start paying for trainings, what does that look like of a top priority versus lower? Thank you. That leads to my next question. It says to be a COC partner. What does that mean? Yeah, um, definitely more information to come in the super near future. Um, but essentially, it uh, will formalize a, a few aspects that um, uh, just sort of uh, integrate someone with the COC, right? So it's um, sitting on a committee or work group regularly, um, participating in community events like Pit Count, um, an organization that's uh, enrolled in, in HMIS, um, a few other categories too. Essentially, it's, it's really just going to be a, a tool for um, understanding who is in the LMS. Um, it's something that we, we want to make sure is um, accessible to the community. So it's not going to be, a, you know, a barrier, um, but just to get a better understanding of, of who's using the system. Okay, thank you. My only comment about that is as we talk about the little COC and the big COC, the broader we can make that partnership, the better off we'll be as a system, which I'm sure you all know, but I just needed to say it because I have a microphone. And the third thing is you've talked about costs now, <laughs> like I've heard it mentioned a couple of times. I know we were trying to fundraise around getting this whole thing started. Is there going to be, I'm not asking for exact dollar amounts, but I heard maybe a fee for training on a particular class or a membership or a user fee or any of those things? So at this time, um, we don't anticipate implementing any fees or charges. Uh, we want it to be, um, you know, a tool for the community. Um, 
we do have uh, the opportunity also to to contract with. Um, I think this might be what uh, you're referring to to contract with um, partners to produce trainings. Um, but in terms of accessing the trainings, um, there aren't any plans for for fees at this time. And one more time, what was the name of the system that, like, I think I saw it on the slide, but I don't have it in front of me. Yeah, the, the Maricopa Regional COC Learning Gateway. Okay, so did we, did, did, was the ultimate thing to partner with the group in Tucson, or is this a whole new thing we're starting? I'm just trying to figure out, like, where we were from where the last time I heard about this. Yeah, th this is um, just our continuum of care um, with uh, some crossover in, in terms of content that can be shared between the two. What's the software? WorkRamp. R-A-M-P. Uh, but to add to what Dylan said about the cross-sharing, we're still working with Tucson Balance Estate and Access to figure out um, if somebody takes a training in a different portal, like if you take one in Relias and then that same training is in the Maricopa COC, how do you get uh, like approval on both of them rather than just one? So we're working on all of that technology on the back end, but that's not to say if you are a statewide agency who does work in Tucson and in Maricopa that you would have to take the training twice as a user too, just because we're in separate portals. Katie, I'd like to recognize Natalie, who has a question. Thank you so much. Um, Dylan, great job. And like everyone else, I heard you've been working so hard on this. And so I heard that in your voice and your excitement. And so thank you for what you've been doing and the team that's supporting you, because I know there's a lot of people that have been involved. Um, my only thought in this, and it's just a suggestion and knowing Mag and the staff and how creative you are, you're probably already heading in this direction, but I just thought I'd add um, that once we start identifying different types of training, I would encourage us to think about it from a user's perspective. Um, so in other words, maybe there are categories of training. Um, you know, maybe there's one that is um, for practitioners, and it's based on um, best practices that are happening nationally, but also happening in our region. Um, and, and maybe there's, you know, members of our board that create panel discussions to talk about what we're doing and what works and, and where we've had challenges um, in those areas. And maybe there's another category that is really geared toward new people who are starting to work in this space um, just to understand all of the definitions and the different reports that are that we they really ought to be following or data that is available to them to understand what we're doing. Um, I, I just think there are ways to categorize these trainings that are really based on what the user is looking for um, instead of um, requiring the user to figure out what they want to see and look at. I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's what I was thinking as you were talking about this. Yeah, thank you, Natalie. Um, it definitely makes a lot of sense. Um, and it's gonna be a huge priority to make sure that um, it is incredibly uh, intuitive for users. Um, and so this platform will, will certainly offer that flexibility in um, organizing content, not only for specific users, but also um, for types of content too. So um, it'll definitely be, um, yes, exactly what you're saying. Thank you, Dylan. Any additional questions before we move on? Uh, yes, hi, this is Jacqueline with US Feds. I was just wondering, will, will there be an opportunity for uh, continuing education credits for those who may be eligible for, for those? Thanks, Jacqueline. Um, we don't have any plans at this time, but that definitely could change um, as we you know, get it launched. Um, definitely appreciate the suggestion and we'll look into it. Okay, and then my only other question was, um, how are they determining the priority of curriculums that will be launched first? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so one of the factors is, is like Katie was saying, um, inputting content that 
sort of already exists, um, just so so something is out there. But um, another huge factor is, um, you know, as a COC, we are required to give some trainings, um, required by HUD or or required as part of the um, NOFO process. Um, so a lot of those trainings um, will be um, included first. Dylan, I just have a, a follow-up question and just uh, better understanding the process. And when we were reviewing the learning management system, was it the work group that really developed and reviewed, not developed, but really reviewed and analyzed the efficacy of the information that was being brought forth? Or how did we make that determination that this training will be a go and it's valid and viable? The training, the training itself, as we're examining the content that's being available. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there are a lot of ways that this can go down. Um, I, I think um, one of the uh, big benefits to this platform is um, very immediate feedback from users that are um, uh, pursuing the training, um, which is something that we haven't always had in the past. Um, Survey monkeys here or there, um, but there will be, uh, you know, really uh, detailed information on how people are uh, receiving these courses, um, and then you know that can better inform um, whoever is developing the training, whether it's a outside partner or or whoever else. So, um, you know, we want this platform to be um, living and breathing and um, constantly changing with. Uh, what the community needs. Thank you. All right, we'll go ahead and move on to the next agenda item. We're going to discuss the board mission statement. In preparation for the continuum of care charter revision, we're going to be reviewing the board's mission statement. Katie is going to display the mission statement on the screen, but, and we want to have a brief discussion relevant to that about any additional changes or modifications that we might want to make to the mission statement. Uh, so your current mission statement is highlighted in blue right now. Um, you all reviewed and made significant changes to this last year when you reviewed your charter. Um, so want you all to take a second to review it. This is also in your packet, but if you have any changes or thoughts on it of ways you would like it changed, I'm happy to take those. I had a, okay, is it okay? I had a couple of thoughts. I, I'm always one to try and condense it as best as possible. So that what I had was the continuum of care board plans for the region, convenes diverse stakeholders that addresses homelessness and makes regional policy recommendations to local leaders. We stand ready to support and provide expertise to local efforts addressing homelessness. So I had take out lean in. Lean in doesn't mean anything to me. So it's just, it's just tweaking it, making it a little shorter. I have some other thoughts on this. Um, I don't remember if I was involved in this last year or not, but I feel like we need to say more about what we do. And maybe that's not the purpose. Maybe that goes elsewhere. But for me, we oversee the, it, it says plans for the region. Does that mean we oversee the MAG regional homeless plan? If that's the case, I think we should say that. Um, HUD COC funding. And we convene stakeholders and make policy recommendations for the Maricopa County region. I'm just feeling like it could be a little more concrete. I, I would take out the second sentence because that doesn't, you know, I would shorten it just to be one sentence and more concrete on what we do. I don't know how others feel about that. So Katie, question here for you on process, because I'm a process guy. So is the is the plan to have open dialogue and conversation to narrow this down? Does it need to be approved today? Or can these be things that we can work on 
and then come back to the group since there are some here, some that are not, and some may want to digest the different ideas. Uh, you all can wait to pass this. This will be part of your charter, which will come to you in May and get approved in June. Um, this is something, it, I will say it's quite interesting because these are the exact languages that you are taking out this year that you added last year. So um, <laughs> would just kind of like bring that to your attention. But yeah, you all are welcome to kind of, we can send this out and have you all approve it next month if you would prefer to do that, if you all have that, or we can approve it today. It was um, on your action for agenda. So you can vote on it today, or you can vote to table or choose to table it and um, come back to it next month. Taylor, can you see if anybody online has had comments? Natalie. Big surprise, I know. Um, so I'm just, I have a question. I was, I'm confused because I remember when we went through our strategic planning session with each other, there was a, you know, vision, mission, and then some goal statements or values. Um, how is this different than what we had there and why don't they match? Great question, Natalie. Uh, the vision, mission, and values go across the entire continuum of care versus this is directly your mission statement for the board. So if, Tyler, if you scroll up in this document, uh, right above this, um, keep going, keep going. Here is your top vision, mission, and top six values as the entire continuum of care. And then that statement down below was directly like, what is the board's mission and what is the board responsible for? Versus these are much encompass the board, your nine lateral committees, as well as all of your work groups. Also, if you all have changes to this vision, mission, vision, mission, and top six values, you would encompass that during your char complete charter review rather than just your mission statement review. Sounds like we don't need to decide it today, but as I'm looking at this, obviously the things I'm seeing are very much tactical. And the reason I jumped to those is because, is it clear that we oversee the regional homeless plan? Do we or do we not? We clearly oversee the COC funding, convene stakeholders, make policy recommendations surrounding homelessness for the region. So that's where my thinking is. I'm not saying it's the right direction, but um, I feel like the more clarity in our mission statement, perhaps the better. Kelly, can you scroll down a little bit further? So this, your mission can stand alone, but you also have a set of roles and responsibilities. So um, this is, keep going a little bit further. This is your entire charter or your section of the charter is what I should say. Um, you have a series of roles and responsibilities um, that you all are responsible for. Keep going, one more page, I swear, right here. Um, so this is where you're like strategic planning, your strategic priorities, you're promoting understanding, conversing different. This is like all of the action steps that you have to do, the like really tactical, not to say that that can't also be in your mission statement, but that really, this, I don't want you to think your mission statement stands alone separate from all of the other pieces of your charter. Natalie, your hand's still up or is it? Nope, I got a new question for you. Um, thank you for recognizing me. So when was this last reviewed by the community um, at large? I mean, when, how long ago did that work happen to come up with the existing mission statement and everything that we've got here? The board's mission statement, Natalie, or the mission, vision, and values? No, the board's mission, this one with the charter. This is something you all as a board have reviewed on an annual basis. We have not taken it to the community. The okay. mission, vision, and values was taken to the community in 2021 um, when you all completely rewrote all of those. We didn't have a mission, vision, and values. Um, and then each year we ask each committee or board to review their own mission statements and then review the entire charter as a whole and give feedback for you all to adopt on an annual basis. Okay. I just want to make sure that we're recognizing a lot of work goes into some of these statements. And I know there's 
um, you know, past boards, but also community members that care about what we've done. And I just want to make sure that we're not doing things too quickly or minimizing, you know, the work that's already been done. So I'll just say that at this point. Um, this is Rob. I just have one uh, comment just to throw out to the universe. And could you know this um, with new board members coming and those stepping away? That's why to some it can be new to look at to maybe want to be able to digest and incorporate. Um, so for those that have been here a little bit longer and those that are new, newer to be able to respect and let them think through that. Um, this is not my decision, but I'm almost feeling that it is something we should talk through and move forward. And I don't know how we could um, gain the suggestions that we have currently to funnel them to the board to be able to review and then move forward with that. Because I think some of it is tactical. There also are some that are not here today, but also um, the opportunity to look at it holistically based off of what's been done before. That's just my suggestion. I don't know if anybody else on the board has a comment or a thought. I have a comment. <clears throat> this is Michael Hughes. I, I would just say this, that nothing is more painful than going through this every year and unfair to the staff. So if you guys want to uh, take out my tires for, you know, my, <laughs> <laughs> for my suggestion about, you know, changing a few words, I, I'm happy to, to, you know, not even make that suggestion because a lot of time and effort's gone into this and we have more important things than, than to, to tweak two or three words. So I, I, I think to Natalie's point, it does go back to the history. It does go back to what, you know, a lot of effort went into this. And if this for the most part captures it, we could be here for days adding, you know. I would just like to know you should get to your top your mission, vision, and top six values took six strategic planning sessions in 2021. So take that how you all want to take it. But we're happy to send out kind of three different suggestions. Have you all as a board take a vote um, and move this forward. Uh, completely up to you all. I'll, I'll provide my suggestions. I don't think we're focused enough on, and I and my reason for wanting to take a look at it, and I agree we should limit it to one meeting, maybe have myself and a couple of people talk, and I liked your suggestions, but I think it'll help us define our focus. For instance, I still don't know, are we overseeing the MAG Regional Homeless Plan? Can any, I mean, can you clarify what the MAG Regional Homeless well, Plan is? Because that's not, there's a regional homeless plan that the uh, several, what? Pathways, Pathways Home. Home, right? Pathways Home. So the board is not responsible for overseeing Pathways Home. MAG Regional okay. Council is responsible. You all receive a quarterly okay. update on the work of Pathways Home. You all are responsible for the board strategic plan. Perfect. Then what plans for the region do we oversee? Plan. Okay. But it, when it says plans for the region. So for me, it's about clarity of our purpose and the fact that I as a board member, and, and I know that was told to me before, but helping me be as focused as possible. We oversee the funding decisions, convene stakeholders to what end. So I'll take a look. I don't wanna have a lot of meetings. I'm just thinking it can help with clarity of our purposes is what's jumping out for me as a new board member, but as someone who's attended these in the past too. So um, that's where I'm coming from. Hi, again, this is Matthew Kelly, uh, Mercy Care. Um, I'm wondering, is there a requirement to review this every single year, or is this something that the board makes a decision on and potentially could modify that request? The board is required to review the governance charter and as a whole on an annual basis, that is a requirement by HUD. Uh, because we had not reviewed mission statements across the entire COC, uh, like committees and everything, uh, we did make the decision to review them at least once. But in the future, this would just be part of the governance charter review. I apologize. I'm going to need a bit of clarification on that. <laughs> so HUD requires that we review the governance charter once per year, which is separate from the mission statement. But I'm confused. I apologize. 
The mission statements are incorporated in the governance charter, right. but it has been something that uh, the committees have kind of skimmed over for the past few years. And there has been, there are some committees that have really dove into their mission statement and changed a lot of pieces of it last year. Others didn't touch them at all. And they didn't really encompass what committees were doing. So that's why the decision was made to look at them. Okay. But back to the governance, it's a HUD requirement annually. There's not a way to modify that. Correct. Okay. Thanks. That's, I just, it seems, it seems redundant, I guess, is my only thought process. And my apologies for that. But to uh, Michael's point, we do a lot of work and this is a lot of work spent. So thanks. We've had a lot of good discussion around this and, and thank you both board and public for the feedback that you provided. I think one of the things we can do uh, in honor of the conversation that we've had, we'll go ahead and still move forward on taking a vote and see, um, you know, see where we land. So we'll go ahead. Uh, for those in favor, we'll go ahead and ask. Please say yes. Sorry for uh, the minute's sake. Are you taking a vote on the mission statement as is or as is? As is. Okay. As is. Sorry, you can use your story. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, that's okay. This is let us know where we land and where we need to where we need to go from here. So those in favor, please say yay. 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 Those opposed, please say nay. I'm gonna abstain because I think we should take a look at it, but if the majority votes for it, I'm fine. Uh, for those online, I'll take a roll call vote. Jacqueline Campbell. Abstain. Uh, Natalie Lewis. Aye. Sean Pierce. Aye. Danielle Wright. Yeah, sorry. Couldn't get the, I couldn't <laughs> unmute. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the motion passes unanimously with two abstentions. Thank you. We'll go ahead and move on to our next agenda item. We're going to be discussing board strategic plan work group. Uh, the board strategic plan includes two, uh, two items for the continuum of care board. I'm going to turn it over to Katie to give an overview of those action items. Thank you, Co-Chair Phillips. Uh, as part of your packet, um, your board strategic plan included two different items that was tasked to the board. Um, those two items were uh, discussions with public housing authorities to increase project-based voucher allocations to support low-income housing tax credit developers, and then discussion with coordinated entry to connect the, uh, to be able to directly connect with low-income housing tax credit developers. And so wanted to have a conversation with you all of if that is still an interest of you all to have those two items within your board strategic plan, but secondarily forming a work group to start to move the work forward on those two items. Having those items in this meeting is probably a little bit too many people um, to actually make some progress on those. So um, a lot of that is going to be discussion with our public housing authorities and discussion with low-income housing tax credit developers to see if they're willing to place-based vouchers and place-based coordinated entry vouchers into their properties as they're going through that process. So looking to you all to see if there is interest and if we have some volunteers. We'll just echo Katie, thank you very much for that. And uh, can we get a few volunteers to be part of the work group? I'll volunteer. Lisa and Lisa Glow, Charles Sullivan. I'll volunteer. And Michael Hughes, thank you. Okay, Katie, we'll work with you on uh, setting a meeting date to participate in the work group. I will also state that this is a work group, so it is open to anybody who would like to volunteer. It will be in, on the website uh, with a link. So we have a lot of interest from our audience today, um, but that will schedule around board members, but also make that available to anybody who's interested. If you are interested in, in participating in a work group, they're all on our website under the overview of committees tab under the continuum of care with a full list of all of the different staff members and times that those are meeting. All right, thank you very much. The next item is a request for future agenda items. So uh, we'll go ahead. Do board members have any action or discussion items for future meetings that they would like to add? We've had the work group uh, be uh, something that uh, is of interest. We've also discussed, I think, looking at the um, 
the overarching uh, components of participation and you know whether or not the committees can participate and who should you know how do we link both the, the committees with the board and open comments so i think we've had a few uh, good discussion points there so anything else this is sean pierce i i think it would be helpful if we had some more information um on the deliverables that we talked about today and kind of drilling down on some of those and figuring out where, what are next. So when we're talking about action items and action plans and all of that, what are we looking for? And what do we need to be digging in to find out more about? Um, you know, it's great to, I mean, it's not great that it's six months behind because I have a feeling we may not like the next six months of data that's coming through, um, but what, what, where are the safe, or the safe spots? Like where, are, where are we seeing good results? Where do we see um, additional decline? What are some of the things that that the groups are actually taking action on in these areas? So we're informed a little bit differently than just the uh, the report that we got today because I don't want to be chicken little. But I also don't want to just kind of go, okay, great, we have that report, now let's keep moving forward. So I, I, I'm looking to other members of the board to maybe bail me out on this one, but I, I hope I was clear on what I was trying to get at. Yes, I think we're good, Sean. Natalie, would you like to? Um, and my, this is an idea and for the board to kind of consider and maybe we agendize it for additional conversation, but I would be curious about um, identifying board representatives for every single one of our committees and maybe a backup um, and, and that the role of those board members is to attend and to listen and to ask questions and ask them that's those same questions that we've asked before, which is what do they need from the board and what do they want the board to know? So that when we come back to our meetings, um, we can also report out what we're hearing um, most recently from some of the committees. Um, I just feel like um, once in a while, connection with the committees isn't gonna really help us help them or for them to help us. Um, and. I'm certainly not someone who wants more work, um, but I, I think this is this is important to what we're doing. And we're asking those committees to volunteer their time. I think it's important that it connects with what we're doing in our strategy. Great comment. Natalie, this is Rob. Just to tag on to that, we do have several board members that are part of some of the committees. And I do think that maybe part of that is actually calling on them in some of the meetings to be able to provide that update more proactively uh, to be able to continue that communication. So thank you for that. And just making sure that every committee has some coverage then. Yep, mm -hmm. 100%. Thank you, Natalie. All right, um, for the next Katie. agenda. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Can I interrupt? Sorry. I was trying to wait for the board to finish. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody that the coordinated entry evaluation discussion starts on Thursday today or this week. Um, so if anybody is interested in hearing the results of that coordinated entry evaluation. I think there's two presentations that are going to be happening regarding the evaluation. And the first one is Thursday afternoon. I know that Meg has the um, the sign up for that. I know I've heard that there's about 35 people signed up, so we'd love to see more of the board present. I know from coordinated entries perspective, also lived experience and race equity, that's the majority or a lot of the work we're going to be working through. So hearing what's coming out of that eval will be, I think, super helpful. Matthew, you clarifying, did you say that you want the board to present or you want the board present? Just present. So um, home base will be doing the presentation on Thursday. I believe there's going to be one more scheduled. So there's about six recommendations, is my understanding. They're going to cover three this meeting and then the other three the following meeting that hasn't been scheduled yet. But it will kind of do a deeper dive into some of the information and the data. Um, obviously, that's all going to be informing pretty much a large portion of the work that those three committees will be doing moving forward. And I'm sure that we're gonna need the support of the board for a lot of that work. So great, thank, thank you. you. Board members, you all received an email with that information and where to register. Matt, just for clarity on under the agenda, are you looking for that to be a future agenda item at the board or is that just a comment? 
Um, yes, I, I mean, I, I wanted to comment on it because I think it's important, but I think definitely as the EVO about progresses, we're gonna want this as a standing agenda item for a period of time. I think as it develops, I know there's gonna be a lot of work in the first three months, I think developing the longer plan. So we we'll wanna do that minimally, if not more regularly, so. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Matt. Uh, are there any any additional comments that the or announcements or events that the board would like to highlight? Okay. Uh, before I close the meeting uh, today, there's just a couple of, of announcements that I want to make um, before I, I uh, move on uh, to discuss Rob. Uh, I wanted to really take a moment to recognize someone who is really a pioneer in our field who we lost. Uh, I'd like to recognize Ted Williams. Ted Williams did so much for our community and really was a housing guru long before it was a thing. And um, to our system and anyone here uh, who had the pleasure of working with him, uh, I just would like our community to, to give a shout out to Ted and, and hold him in our hearts and his family as well. So, uh, Next, I would like to recognize uh, Rob. Podlegar and his time on the board. He is actually stepping down from the board to take a new position at Candellan. Uh, I want to I want to give Rob a chance to say a few words and open it up to the board uh, as well to say a few words to Rob. Great, thanks, Vicky. She and I were practicing this pronunciation of the this, uh, the organization for about an hour or so. Um, uh, been on the board now for a little over a year, about a year in this. Uh, space as co-chair, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity of being new to Phoenix over the past two and a half years uh, to be able to work with individuals uh, on this that is critical. Uh, it's been uh, enlightening to me. It's been a, a glue for me to learn about the critical things that are important to Maricopa County. So um, I am excited that on April 10th, I'll be going over to Kendellen uh, to be their new CEO. Um, looking forward to after 12 years now being a funder in my day life at Valley of the Sun in my previous, uh, to now be a service provider. Uh, so this is an opportunity that I just not could, I could not pass up, uh, came out of the woodwork and I'm excited. So thank you for the friendships, for the conversations, and um, you'll know where to find me. So what do you, what is the agency? Tell me more about it. So it's and congratulations. Uh, early, thank you. I appreciate that. So it's uh, early learning centers uh, within um, Arizona as well as we're branching out into parts of Nevada. So zero to five. Thank I, you. I would just like to say congratulations on uh, the the direction, the step with Candellan. Uh, yes, it did take me quite quite a bit of time Can to I just keep learn saying that. it to someone <laughs> so she knows. She Reemphasize it. I just want to say thank you. I've appreciated working with you, and you've been fantastic, and um, just learning from you along the way. I really appreciate that, and I wish you well. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Rob, I want to say thank you as well, and I want to thank you for your patience because I'm new to the board and new to the circle, and I ask a lot of questions, and you have been um, everything gracious and um, <laughs> and patient with me. So thank you very much for that. Well, we all learn from each other. So thanks, Natalie. Congratulations, Rob. Thank you. Congratulations. I just want to say that I made the comment about air in my tires. Now I know Vicki might really be letting the air out because I had said, this is a piece of cake. You two will work great together. And uh, what, you have three meetings? <laughs> You're all in good hands. You're all in good hands. All right. Thank you very much. Any additional comments before we move on? No? Okay. With uh, Rob's seat being open, uh, that means we now have zero seats within the funder position outside of jurisdictions. So we will be opening up board recruitment. Uh, board recruitment will be open today, and it will stay open through April 14th. May I ask for three volunteers from the board to be on the membership work group for review during the week of April 17th? I'd be happy to help. Sean. Sean. All right, if I don't get volunteers, I'll have to volunteer you. <laughs> I, I see Charles uh, over there, who's, who's slightly raising his hand, which will take that as a go. <laughs> and Danielle. 
Thank you. All right. So we've got Sean, Charles, and Danielle. Perfect. All right. Thank you all very much for your willingness to participate. Uh, Katie will work with you to schedule a work group, and we will approve members in April, and the new board members will start in May. Some of the perspectives currently underrepresented on the COC board include non-jurisdiction funders, community seats, and other advocacy seats. We continue to seek to diversify board membership focused on recruiting people with lived experience, racial and ethnic diversity, geographic diversity, and underrepresented groups. We invite anyone interested to apply. Okay, it's already on the website. Perfect, all right, Katie, quick moving. All right, with no further business, this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.